Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Welcome to this special webinar from the Foreign Correspondents Club of South Asia based in Delhi. And this uh, webinar is being conducted jointly by the Foreign Correspondents Club of South Asia with the International Solar Alliance and the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. Uh, this, is, this is a very special subject. Tomorrow, AISA will be holding the first solar power technology summit, which is a global summit. And we are very happy to have special guests brief the media and interact with the media on uh, the, the global conference tomorrow. So I'd like to uh, welcome our president, Mr. S. Venkat Narayan, uh, president of the Foreign Correspondents Club of South Asia, and request him to please introduce our two special guests. Before that, I'd like to mention that also with me, as my colleague from Foreign Correspondents Club of South Asia, is Mr. Sanjeev Miglani. Uh, he is the head of uh, Bureau Chief of Reuters, uh, based in New Delhi also. Venkat, over to you. Thank you, Manish. Good afternoon, friends. I'm delighted to uh, co-host uh, this very important uh, pre-summit interaction with the foreign media by FIKI and uh, ISA. Let me start by introducing uh, Mr. Upendra Tripathi. Uh, he is the head of the ISA. He's been um, in the IAS, Indian Administrative Service. He spent 36 years working in uh, diverse uh, departments and acquiring uh, enormous amount of expertise uh, in uh, new and renewable technologies. And he has won at least half a dozen awards for his excellent work. Um, uh, in uh, in uh, you know solar energy and the new energy and so on, he now heads the International Solar Alliance as uh, Director General, and he was former uh, Secretary to the Government of India in the Ministry of New and Renewable, Renewable Energy, and he had headed at least six institutions related to new and renewable renewable energy. A warm welcome to you, uh, Mr. Tripathi. We now have Mr. Uh, Rohit Modi. He is the co-chair of FIKI Renewable Energy CEO's Council and country head and president of SB Energy of the SoftBank Group. He has more than three decades of experience across government and private sector uh, in um, uh, Public private partnerships, solar and renewable energy, financing, development, and so on. And he also is from the prestigious IAS. During the British time, they used to call it uh, the steel frame. Um, this is a very prestigious event. We are delighted to co host this with the FIKI and ISA. And uh, these two gentlemen are going to brief the foreign media and the Indian media and whoever is joining us across the globe on uh, YouTube and Facebook and the FCC website. So let's kick start. Mr. Tripathi, may I invite you to speak? Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Venkat Narayan. Uh, uh, I mean, we were very grateful to the Foreign Correspondents Club and uh, of course to, uh, you know, Piki too for having brought us together. Uh, and uh, thank you for giving me the initial turn to speak about the International Solar Alliance. Now, for the ones who are uh, new, I'll just uh, make two, three lines. Uh, uh, this uh, international is a treaty-based organization, and uh, 87 countries have signed so far uh, the treaty, and uh, it was opened in Marrakesh in COP21, and, uh, uh, and uh, 68 member countries we have across uh, the world, and uh, Initially, we had a restriction that only countries between the tropics can be members. Uh, but now that restriction has been removed through the First Amendment. So countries like Germany, Spain, Italy, Mongolia, and even some of the India's neighboring countries can uh, join the uh, alliance. Uh, essentially, we have a big target uh, under the treaty itself. We have to mobilize more than $1,000 billion uh, by 2030 uh, among our member countries. Uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, problems uh, in raising so much of uh, investment in solar in our member countries. Uh, in the last two and a half years, uh, we have been uh, doing a lot of uh, good work in capacity building, 
uh, we are doing a lot of good work in you know sending technical assistance missions to member countries uh, we globally uh, what we did we aggregated demand for 272000 solar pumps bringing down the price by almost 40% so it becomes cheaper for member countries and uh, recently we have also floated a 47 million home lighting system tender for 53 countries so as you can make out we bring together the demand of countries to bring down the price but then uh, under the treaty we have to do it through two ways a we have to bring down the cost of capital and also cost of technology so far we are busy in number one bringing down the cost of capital you know uh, involving banks having a program on finance and this event uh, on 8th, uh, what we call, you know, uh, rightly the first, uh, you know, uh, World Solar Technology Summit. Now, uh, it is world over, it is the solar technology, it is the summit. And uh, this summit we have planned in such a way that we have an inaugural. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, we have the Nobel laureate Whitting, uh, Whittingham, who invented the lithium ion battery, is known the father of lithium ion battery. We have Mr. Picard who went around the world in a solar tech, you know, a solar plane, the solar impulse, and uh, and what can be better solar technology than you know flying a plane itself? Uh, we have a whole lot of CEOs who have been kind enough to come, and we have a CEO session, and then we have four technical sessions, and these technical sessions, the uh, you know the, the the first one is of course we are talking about how the technology landscape will be beyond 2030. And, uh, uh, and and then we have a session about a decarbonized uh, grid. Uh, so essentially, you know, we are talking about uh, how solar can move from beyond power generation to agriculture, to industry, to transportation, to building construction, to cooling, to you know, universalize. And uh, in this also, we are looking at, you know, what are the non-silicon technologies which are going to come in. And then in ISA, you know, we have something called skill, scale, uh, and speed. You do things with skill, with speed, and uh, you know, scale. Uh, and and then you look at that uh, in in the Solar Alliance. If we have to really give clean energy to two billion women who don't have clean cooking fuel today, or 700 million people who have no access to electricity, the price of solar has to come further down. At some point, we are talking about grid parity. Then we talked about kerosene parity, the cost of solar coming and matching with kerosene. We have come to a point, we talk about near zero cost of solar. Now it's around one cent in some countries. Now when you say near zero cost of solar, uh, it, it cannot be uh, achieved without actually an active role of uh, technology. So this whole conference that we are planning, when we have got around uh, 28,000 participants from almost 144 countries uh, and a variety of, uh, you know, I mean, very learned, very uh, famous uh, uh, speakers, uh, honorable ministers from a variety of countries, and even ISIS governance structure. India as president, France as co-president, and they have four regional vice presidents, Peru from Latin America, Togo from Africa, Tonga from uh, Asia Pacific, and the UK from Europe. They, we all have come together. We are bringing a variety of uh, stakeholders academicians, scientists, researchers, uh, uh, industry uh, together. And you can see, you know, Rohit is present uh, here, who in fact uh, is not only an industry head uh, and not only a member, you know, not only presides over the Renewable Energy Committee of the uh, Federation of Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. He also, uh, th their company is also a corporate partner of uh, ISA. Uh, and uh, he will be speaking more on that. So this event is the first event and is not the last one. We are going to repeat it. And it has a counterpart. In January, we are going to put something called uh, World Solar Investment Summit. So as I told, you know, ISA has two eyes. One is capital. The other is technology. Technology we are dealing on eight. And similarly, down the line, we'll have a World uh, Investment or Solar Investment Summit. So these two events are signature events, landmark events where we not only sensitize our members and the communities, but we also try to achieve a number of, uh, you know, excellent. For example, tomorrow we are signing an agreement with the International Institute of uh, Refrigeration in Paris. We are, uh, you know, for bringing in cooling in uh, uh, with solar technologies. We are signing an agreement with uh, National Thermal Power Corporation of India to start 47 innovative projects in small island countries and uh, LTCs. 
we are signing an agreement that is very interesting with the World Bank and with the government of India to bring something called One World, One Sun, One Grid. And uh, uh, so these are the excellent points that we are highlighting uh, tomorrow. But the more important one, which actually affects, you know, you know, agriculture and, uh, you know, income of farmers is being signed with Green Growth Global Institute uh, in Korea. And we are together putting up a roadmap for solarizing one million uh, diesel driven pumps. So uh, thank you once again for uh, having me, given me this opportunity. You are most welcome. Please uh, visit our website and register. And we would love you to participate in the event. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Mr. Tripathi, uh, let us now hear from Mr. Rohit Modi as part of, he, he heads the so, uh, SoftBank Energy uh, Company, part of the SoftBank Group and is, and is the co-chair of the FIKI Council, I guess, on Renewable Energy, uh, Council of CEOs on Renewable Energy. Mr. Modi, please. Uh, thank you, Munish. Uh, thank you, Venkat, uh, Upendra and uh, Mr. Tripathi and Sanjeev. You know, at, at the outset, I must first congratulate ISA, the International Solar Alliance, for initiating and organizing this first world solar technology summit and galvanizing such large participation. You have almost more than 28,000 parts of registrations from, let's say, 140, 144, 149 countries. In these COVID times, really remarkable. My, my, my hats off, my compliments to all of you. You know, second, I must say, uh, FIKI, which is Federation of Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, is honored in having partnered with ISA in organizing the summit. So, and as a co-chair, and fortunately, unfortunately, my chair is actually himself down with COVID of the FIKI Energy Council. You know, I can say that the entire renewable energy industry, both in India and abroad, is not only enthusiastic, is optimistic, but actually sees a great sunshine and great, great path forward about meeting the government's vision across the world, whether it's, whether it's in India or anywhere else, to scale up solar energy. And, but what is critical, and you know, this is what I wanted to mention this, which is where ISA comes in. But both countries and corporates look forward for four things. They look forward to economies of scale, the, because that then brings about a whole lot of efficiencies. They look forward to diversity. They look forward to international best practices. And they look forward to innovation and change. I think many of the countries and corporates by themselves are too small to be able to reap these benefits. And that is where ISA and forums like this can be that bridge. They can be that bridge to help smaller countries, smaller companies to leapfrog, to reap the benefits of economies of scale, to reap the benefits to learn from shared learning, to reap the benefits and contribute to innovation and change. You know, in the past, there were two barriers. And the two barriers of solar energy clearly were, what were they? They were commercial and technical. The commercial barrier was the tariff was too high. The technical barrier is it's not energy on demand. You and I don't want to tailor our energy requirements. We want to have it when we want it. So what has happened? Today, the tariffs have fallen across the world from multi-dollar tariffs. to We are now single-digit tariffs and lower single-digit tariffs. The way I look at it, when Mr. Upen Tripathi mentioned to this, we are well, zero cost is fine to say, but we'll basically be having tariffs of the order of one to one and a half cents in the next three years. Going forward, it would be sub, it would be sub one cent. At sub one cent, it is close to reaching zero. Like interest rates have come down in developed countries, you will have tariffs for solar energy at the same level. So the commercial challenges will be over. In fact, it will be far more attractive. If I were to hazard and you know be audacious. I think these conferences for solar are a matter of only the next five to 10 years time. 10 years later, you would not be having conferences for solar energy. You would be having conferences on how to, how to make the fossil energy survive and how to make that industry not vanish and get fossilized. So I think commercial parity is already happening. But second, the, uh, the larger challenge which remains is the issue of intermittency of power, which is a technical challenge. Intermittency of power means and what is what are the countries and policymakers around the world doing. They are encouraging 24 by 7 power. They are encouraging round the clock power. And you know, you have, let's say we have, the conference has invited the, the Nobel laureate for energy, for energy storage, whether through battery, whether through pump storage, whatever means and manner would be the way forward. The way I look at it for any industry, any sector to go forward, it simultaneously works on four, four areas. 
It clearly works on business models. It works on policy innovation. It looks at financial engineering and technical engineering. I don't think we can overemphasize the importance of one over the other. It's all these four which work on this. And you know, to this extent, today we are seeing not even large countries like USA, China, India, but even smaller countries. Uh, they're not small, but, but you know, countries like let's say Vietnam, South Korea, every one of them is investing huge amounts of money in technology and R&D. We are seeing cross-country solar technological challenges. And you know, I would say this market, in fact, and I mentioned again earlier, everybody talks of several billion dollars, trillion dollars of economy. I'm saying solar will be the economy, will be the energy sector. So it's the size, the world is the size of the industry going forward. And with that the perspective, I just want to say, you know, SoftBank, for example, has been known around the world for taking bets on technology. Most of our bets in SoftBank were actually or basically on shared platforms, on, on technology, on innovations. Yes, COVID has had a small temporary hiccup because shared economy itself was being challenged. But I think there is no other way. But for all of us, there's a lovely African proverb. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, then travel together. International Solar Alliance summits like this World Solar Technology Summit actually serve the purpose of making us all go together. You know, we, for example, well, SoftBank chairs this global leadership task force of corporate and innovation. We have been working with 23 corporates. We have set up five technology innovation missions, one financial innovation mission. Obviously, FICI does the entire back work, the secretariat, the supporting, the organizing, everything. But you know, I think five conferences have been organized with ISA for the last five years. I believe we can, con but the journey has just begun. For me, these are baby steps. Much, much, much more needs to be done. I would be very happy to sit back and talk. I've just shared some very, very preliminary thoughts on what needs to be done. I think fundamentally what ISA does and where corporates play a part, because governments can lay out the policy framework. They can make it enable, they can create the environment where things happen. But ultimately, it's a private sector investment. It's a private sector innovation. It's a private sector initiative. It's a private sector thirst for doing more, doing better, doing faster, doing cheaper, doing better quality is what drives this world. And I think it's this collaboration between the governments of the world and private sector, which actually takes, we are literally like two, if you were to use on a bicycle or a scooter or a two wheeler, we are the, with the two wheels. If you use a four wheeler, we are still the two wheels. That's the way I will look forward. If without this collaboration, each one of us will remain wishful thinking. Together we make wishes come into reality. I would suggest, I would stop at this. I think we have most of the people around the world. We would love to hear what are their questions, thoughts, suggestions on what ISA can do. Fundamentally, what corporates can do, along with governments, is to promote international best practices, is to promote innovations in finance, in policy, in regulation, in business models, in technology, is to promote how do we leverage deep economies of scale, is to promote benefits of diversity, and I, I can go on. And I think I would stop at this. Thank you so much, Munke uh, Manish. Well, thank you. Thank you, both of you, Mr. Tripathi and Mr. Modi, for giving us one an insight into, uh, well, people already know about ISA and, and, and people already understand what the world needs and where the world is going with solar energy. Uh, but as you very lucidly uh, put out, both of you, the, the whole idea was, can we drive down the cost of this energy? And uh, technology and innovation is the answer. I mean, if technology becomes cheaper, and innovation grabs it, then uh, the cost of producing power naturally will come down. And that's the only way to get people to mobilize, you know, mobilize governments and people to come along. But this is a beautiful partnership, the way you've explained. You know, ISA as, as, as a driving uh, policy making platform of countries into government, governmental partnership and institutions like World Bank and others coming together. And then, of course, the private sector, which has to play the role of being the actual one that invests and creates, you know, the power and, and actually distributes it. We have seen the models of government going away from uh, creating, making power and distributing it. Uh, my big question to you is that, you know, we've heard the vision and uh, we've heard the vision and we've seen the, we've heard from you what the goals are. Uh, very ambitious. Um, by 2030, and uh, Anil, don't don't focus on me. Can you put all five of us together on the screen together? I'd like to see reactions. Yes, 
by 2030 you know trillion dollars how much power how many countries would be using as as solar power and uh, and and you see how many of these you have 87 signatory countries and i believe that there is somewhere i read that 144 have expressed interest do you see how quickly the world coming together and signing this protocol with you so first mr tripathi and then mr modi uh, well uh, uh, you know what we are proposing to make it more interesting is uh, a world solar bank now the world solar bank has a simple idea of starting with uh, uh, you know uh, it, in fact the agenda is going to the assembly in october 20 uh, october 14th and of course the assembly is the supreme authority they will decide but the idea is if we can get at least 2 billion dollars uh, uh, in a in a global uh, bank meant for countries who have difficulty in accessing capital and for solar projects 8 billion we raise in the market uh, and uh, co finance with world bank and asian development bank uh say to the extent of 20% so we are talking about 15 billion dollars of investment per year for greenfield and uh, uh you know uh, brownfield solar projects and solar derivatives like green hydrogen so how fast uh, the 194 countries will come in we are very uh, you know hopeful because the amount of uh, interest uh, that have come from a large number of countries to come forward uh, except i must confess uh, covid has uh, been a uh, you know big factor to slow down it a little but uh, post covid uh, we know a, a large number of uh, countries will join us so what we are doing now uh, as a strategy we are uh, reaching out to regions latin american uh, region african region uh, europe uh, as a region and uh, the restriction that were there earlier that is gone and the fact that we don't have a membership fee which is of course a big problem because without membership fee there is no uh, organizations in the world now it runs with uh, you know the host country funds but uh, for good things you know money is not a problem so that itself is an att you know attraction and i am sure in uh, next uh, one year somebody will be getting another uh, you know 60 to 70 country joining us okay mr bodhi you want to add something yeah you know i i'll give you two two just two statistics okay okay so number one today india has let's say an installed power base of in excess of 350 gigawatts okay by 2030 the country is talking of reaching 750 gigawatts out of 350 gigawatts the renewable energy base and leaving hydro part is about 80 gigawatts the country is talking of reaching 450 gigawatts of renewable energy base by by 2030 simple implication of this that over the next decade the country is talking of more than doubling its energy base number one the country is talking more specifically of adding roughly 400 gigawatt out of which 370 gigawatt will come from solar and renewable energy i think that statistic sums up the story for around the world which means 90% of installations in the world 90% installations new installations in the world are going to come from solar and renewable energy base point number 1 and which should tell you which is true for every single country in the world point number 2 the developed countries today have a per capita energy consumption of something like 10000 kilowatt hours per person i am talking of america okay which is very energy intensive come to europe we are talking of energy consumptions in the range of 5 to 6000 kilowatt hours per capita come to india and countries similarly placed as india we are talking of energy consumptions typically in the range of 1000 to 1200 kilowatt hours per capita we are now talking of moving to digital platforms moving to technology work from home every single thing please understand all this is far more energy intensive i cannot have an internet if i don't have power i cannot communicate if i don't have power even the even the vehicles which were earlier on fossil fuel are moving to to battery and power so you are seeing the entire energization movement communication development being driven on energy which means energy per capita energy consumption per capita has to effect significantly improve it will at least around the world double if not triple over the next decade so so summary point two points energy requirement energy consumption despite energy efficiency measures would double to triple for 70% of the world and 90% of the additional of the new energy installations will come from solar and renewable energy i think these two should tell you what are we talking about and what's the so opportunity those, for so those so both, i think those two were very good 
to pointed answers to our questions and thank god and thank the power of universe for the sun because this is it i mean sun will power our lives finally i mean it should have um i'm going to before i ask other questions that are coming to me by by the droves now but sanjeev uh, i believe was ready to ask uh, a question on behalf of reuters sanjeev you have a question oh okay thanks thank you munish and uh, thank you both uh, mr tripathi and mr modi for coming out to the fcc uh, i i you have uh, actually sort of uh, touched upon it both of you in your opening uh, sort of address but i just wanted if there was any way to flesh out a bit one question for perhaps mr tripathi to answer is broadly how is how is corona impacted the industry this year i, I mean you know that's a question everybody wants to know and b can i ask mr modi perhaps to address this is this you also mentioned uh, you know this thing about uh, tariffs down to 1 cent i'm just as a, as as an outsider and i'm looking at it how does then how does the company how do they deliver projects with that kind of tariff how does it work uh, or 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 people are going to back out at that i mean how does it work at that level of tariff then uh and uh, and finally mr modi if you, if i mean this is also obviously it's india related but I mean, we have this ongoing dispute with China, and that has caused an economic freeze. How is that impacting our industry here as a result of uh, our problems with them? Thank you. <laughs> My question is here. I think you know. Well, uh, how COVID has affected the uh, solar industry? Uh, it has definitely has affected. You know, there is a lot of uh, supply chain disruption in terms of uh, uh, you know land acquisition in terms of. Uh, you know other uh, uh, factors but uh, if you look at the statistics you know uh, the the investment in this sector has been much better even during covid period uh, compared to other sectors and one of the main thing is perhaps thing if you look at the the sun of course you know who who never discriminates and are quite reliable for next 4.5 years it will keep on giving us light without charging any money and heat also so to to sum up uh, it did affect i mean the way labor migrated in various countries uh, uh, but the effect on solar industry has been less and that the proof is that if you look at the investment patterns uh, uh, you know compared to other sectors the it, it has not been uh, uh, really negative okay mr modi you i am i am no sanjeev i am going to use my opportunity to even address this issue which mr tripathi mentioned about covid Okay, and I'll come back to the other two questions. You know, I want to tell you one thing on COVID. Yes, there were supply chain disruptions, but believe me, this disruption has been for the better. In fact, if energy post COVID, the entire renewable energy sector and solar in particular is actually much better placed. And for I must really, really appreciate and compliment Government of India, Ministry of Renewable Energy, both the Minister and the Secretary, and Ministry of Power. They have been incredible. We have never had such access, such conversations, such exchanges. like we have had in the last 5 months and i'll give you five examples the industry the sector has been given 5 months carte blanche extension saving so much of management time and bandwidth both on the government side and the developer side we understand the developer can only make money if he starts producing energy so it's in his interest to start yesterday he will do all that it takes but this 5 months saves so much of time and makes me plan much better number one number two the payments have been made across even though the energy demand had dipped it came down from 150 on a particular day to 80 gigawatt yet because it was essential sector the entire solar and renewable energy has actually been paid there have been zero 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 reductions in fact government has specially driven programs 90000 crores discount payments rec everybody has been making sure that we get the payments up the government has issued instructions for deem generation must from states bits have been held or uh, inviting auctions and bits for almost 10 gigawatt if you look at it so industry if anything is stronger better much better that's that's a covid yes there was a temporary hiccup but that's a very small blip in the journey come back to the issue of tariff you asked me a question how will tariff go to sub 1 cent and my answer is i'm only exploring explore, explorating the past to the future please understand that tariffs have already fallen by 96% the input costs have come down by 96% and i'll give you a small example you know we started the cells and modules used to be in dollars per watt peak the salts and modules today are talking of 16 17 18 cents per watt peak and what has happened what has happened is cells and modules which used to be few watts peak per panel 
Then for a long time, it was stabilized at 230, 240, became 330, 340. Today, I'm talking of 500 watt peak panels. I'm talking of 700 watt peak panels. I'm talking of 800 watt peak panels. I'm talking of bifacial solar panels. And, and bifacial will capture LBDO, will capture sunlight from both sides. More important, it will now capture diffuse energy. We are now talking and using bifacial with a tracker. I would actually have a peak not only from 11 to 2, but I can have a peak power production from almost 9 in the morning to 4 or 5 in the evening. So I'm actually addressing the spikes, the spikes in power. Okay, and imagine the same same panel which was producing 300 watt peak is now producing 800 watt peak. What does it do? It does it to land. The land consumption from five acres per megawatt will come down to less than three acres per megawatt, if not two and a half acres per megawatt. The structures, the entire balance of cost, balance of plant will get reduced by 50 percent, if not less. So with the declining input costs, with the declining input quantity, reaching one cent, we already today are, if you see the last bits in India, we're at two rupees 34 pesos, which is just a little over three cents. If you see the latest bits which happened in, in uh, Middle East, we're, in, we're almost at one cent. If you see the latest bits which have happened in Europe, are close to one euro. So we are, the country and the world is already talking of reaching there. Okay, there were specific bits. You could interpret them differently, you know, one was equal to one and a half to all I'm saying is in three years time across the world, the tariffs will come down to one, one and a half cents, including in India, if not less. That's that's my answer number one. So there are basically because of technological changes, because of quantity reductions, because of efficiency improvements, because of ever increasing financial engineering, larger muscles, you name it and we can have a long, long, long story. Okay, that's that's an easy part of the answer. Even anti-China. What is anti-China? Please understand, anti-China is not a sentiment unique to India today. Anti-China, because many of us want to find someone to blame for this halt in our in our normal day-to-day -day life. Across the world, most countries today believe and blame China for what has happened. Without sharing the blame, what has happened? So countries are responding. In India, it has been exacerbated by the border tensions. Okay, I am not a spokesman for government of India, but as a, as a citizen, as an observer. And as, as, a, as somebody whose company industry is deeply impacted by what is happening, what are we doing? We are making plans at different levels. We are saying what is today 80 percent, if not 90 percent of global procurement, especially of solar panels, happens from China. Also, because they have been brilliant, I must acknowledge today the prices have fallen, the entire credit goes to China. Let's not take it away from them. The challenge for a country like India would be, can we match the ever declining prices from China, number one? Can we, we can match, today I can install a 5, 10 gigawatt factory which can match it. Can I ensure I'm not technological obsolescence? Well, I install a 500 watt peak panel and China next year produces an 800 watt peak panel. I would be irrelevant. So how do I make sure that I'm commercially competitive and technologically not being left behind? That's not an easy challenge. So we are obviously dealing with alternative procurements, but I think we must recognize, at least as far as this industry is concerned, China has made a great contribution. Solar industry across the world should be grateful to them for what they've done. Okay, that's the benefit we are all reaping. Yes, inverters we can say which are control panels, so they cannot do. We can shift to India, not not a lot of problem. Okay, so I think that would be my answer at three levels. We have to learn from China at the first level. We have to see can we be commercially competitive and technologically relevant and stay at the at the cutting edge of technology. Number two, which means innovation is the answer. Number three, for things like inverters and all, shift production based to India. And even otherwise, encourage make in India and look at non-China sourcing procurement. Maybe encourage Chinese companies to go outside so they are, they are less under that uh, sovereign control and hopefully less rogue, as one would call it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm being politically incorrect, but I think that's that would be my, my the way I would look at it personally speaking. Well, thank you. That was a great answer. <clears throat> Very pointed, politically correct, incorrect, doesn't matter with media, sir. Um, let's shift the focus to uh, to Europe. We have a question here from uh, one of our managing committee members, PM Narayanan. He works. He's the chief producer for German television, ARD. The question is, Germany is one of the green energy efficient countries in the world. How are you going to partner? Any specific plans? When is Germany planning to join? Is Germany joining? Uh, in fact, uh, Germany, uh, you know, the honorable minister from Germany visited the ISA office a few months back. Uh, we have a series of meetings with the German uh, uh, embassy uh, and uh, we are in fact uh, planning if they could join during uh, on 8th of September but then you know there were August holidays and all that it didn't work out 
but uh, we're inspired by Germany. In fact, uh, you know, uh, as credit goes to China for manufacturing, the, the credit for first sacrificing government money to bring in solar and rooftop uh, and being the, you know, solar driven uh, economy that Germany became, uh, it became a leader. And it has also taken a big role uh, in, in terms of establishing uh, IRENA uh, and it has a center in Bonn. So Germany has played a very, very positive uh, green role across the world always. And we are very hopeful that uh, at the earliest we will have uh, Germany as a member. And that will be a you know, significant step for Aisha uh, because uh, with Germany, we will get uh, collaboration with a number of sub-sovereign organizations in uh, Germany whether it is uh, academics or, you know, it is a type of uh, other uh, organizations. So we, we are looking forward to that. And I'm sure Germany uh, will become a member at the earliest. Uh, one follow-up question real quick. I think you answered this, but anyway, PM still wants to know, Narayan. In the next 10 years, how much will be the solar energy contribution to India's overall energy needs? Uh, uh, 10 years. Now, Look at you know they they, they gave those figures uh, 450 you know gigawatt out of uh, 750 and 90 percent of that uh, as uh, you know Mr Modi told will be solar and the way cost is coming down uh, uh, not only globally even in India and recently India put a new type of uh, innovative bidding it's called uh, 24 by 7 bidding and I, I think a, you know one company called Renew got it. So essentially, they were saying, look, you know, you go for solar, go for your uh, storage, combine whatever else you want, but supply us 24 by 7. And the way floating solar is coming in, you know, on the reservoirs where evacuation is not a big issue. So if you look at that, uh, the percentage of uh, solar in uh, next 10 years, both, uh, you know, on grid as well as uh, uh, rooftop is going to go up very high. And if you look at the India's 100 gigawatt target, uh, you know, uh, they, they had uh, out of which was 60 gigawatt was land based and 40 gigawatt was uh, rooftop based. Both are spreading and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, solar is also going to spread into the uh, transport sector, in the building, uh, you know, cooling uh, sector, into the agriculture sector. So I would say a very significant percentage of that uh, will be solar. Okay. You know, Manish, can I just add two points to this? I want to yeah. add the supplement what Mr. Upendra Sapati has said. You know, one on Germany, please understand one thing. In fact, I gave a lot of credit to China, but that's in the last 10 years. Prior to that, if you look at even today, the solar modules are the most efficient at 25 degrees centigrade. Beyond mm -hmm. that temperature, they start having a deficiency and they lose temperature coefficients. Okay? Which was because the solar panels were designed for countries that they were developed in countries like Germany. In fact, Germany literally was the forefather of creating the solar panels along with Europe. Okay, so I think Germany has had a great role to play. Unfortunately, they have not kept pace on reaping economies of scale and declining prices. So they have been losing out of that. Okay, now, now we all know Germans for the sturdiness, caution, extreme caution. But very often caution is anathema to innovation. There has to be a preparedness to lose. There has to be a risk-taking ability. I think Germany has, without a doubt, they were the ones who started the movement. They were the ones, even to the German factories, German machines, everyone who aspires for them are the greatest and best machines to build. But they will have to catch up. with the, Because countries like India, the entire developing world, the underdeveloped world is far too price sensitive. They cannot afford energy at more than two, two and a half cents today and one cent later. And that's what Germany will have to get to be able to contribute. That's, that's just one thing which I wanted to add for, for Germany push. Okay, on the on the India portion, I just want to say again one thing. If you look at statistically analyze the data, government of India said we'll do 60 gigawatts out of 100 is grid connected and 40 gigawatt out of 100 is rooftop connected. Today we have reached, let's say, a number. You have almost 80 gigawatt of solar which has been awarded. Okay, constructed 37, 38 will be 40. We'll reach 80 in the next two to three years time. Not a problem at all. But please understand, we are where we would have exceeded the targets is on grid. Where would have we failed, relatively speaking, is on rooftop connected. Now, on rooftop, I think across the world, we need to do certain more policy reforms with net banking, for example, net metering, for example, supporting individual households, whether in terms of safety, being able to consume the energy, banking facilities. I think there is still a certain path to be covered by most governments because that is not possible by an individual. That can only be done by the governments. That is a little work in progress is what I would say. These are just my quick two comments on this. 
Great. Uh, one more question from German radio, and then we'll move to the Middle East. Um, uh, you know, this whole thing that you talked about, one sun, one world, one grid, which is quite an ambitious uh, objective, uh, says Mr. Anup Saxena from German radio. And he says, if the government is to develop this concept seriously, it will require serious reforms in regulatory framework governing electricity sector. Uh, are those happening? And how fast are those happening? Well, I mean, the uh, latest thing is, uh, if we, you know, I mean, it's a beautiful, uh, you know, definitely a beautiful idea, you know, one world, one sun, one grid, because the sun shines for 24 hours, the world is round, uh, earth is round, and uh, half the half of earth is always is light. And there are uh, areas, you know, of uh, peak and uh, uh, non-peak areas which can be interconnected and power can flow. But uh, right now, what ISA is doing that we have uh, we are going to sign a partnership agreement tomorrow with the government of India and the World Bank, and uh, we are going to hire an agency who is going to do a pre-feasibility report of this idea. Uh, uh, you know, we are all talking about uh, one sun, one world, one grid, but they will go uh, and examine various parameters about its uh, practical practicability as well as. Uh, you know, which are the regions that can be tackled first? If actually you cannot uh, build a one sun, one world, one grid overnight, it has to be a long term process. Uh, the projects uh, and uh, preparations have to take place. And uh, in other parts of the world where certain developments have taken place about, you know, type of creating mega grids, they have to be interconnected. And you need a political uh, uh, ecosystem for all countries to join. Because the moment you have energy linkage, you have to have understanding of how to deal with it. Maybe you need a you know, World Energy Treaty, uh, uh, which will base essentially regulate uh, the, the type of uh, supplies. Because uh, if the solar cost comes down to less than one cent or the near zero cost that we are talking about, there will be, you know, questions of oversupply, local storage. So there will be various competing factors to determine how this one sun, one world, one grid is going to take shape and how the projects are going to be implemented and whether the World Solar Bank can actually play a big role. But as of now, we have a 15 months uh, time to engage uh, a consultant. In fact, the, 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 the tender is on. And uh, first, the pre-feasibility report has to be done. Mr. Modi, do you want to add anything to that or should we move on to the next? Well, I, th I think it summarizes beautifully. I have nothing more to really, you know, it's what a, what a lovely idea. Look at it like this. And it's true. There is one sun. There is one word. Issues, can we have one grid? That's the only issue. And obviously, it makes logical sense. You know, I can produce solar energy best in Rajasthan and in Leh Ladakh. I cannot produce it in Delhi. So I cannot have a, a solar energy being produced in Delhi. So it has to be one grid. I can extend it. I'm just giving you an example of India. The same logic applies to the rest of the world. Produce energy where you have wasteland. Produce energy where the solar temperature radiation is just perfect. It does not make sense. You know, we talk about specialization. I think so it fits into the bill completely. And that can only be achieved if there's one grid. So I think one, so one sun, one bird, one grid is so beautiful, so appropriate. Nothing more to add. And that's the only way to happen. Yeah. No, no, thank you for that answer. And you know, some of us who understand technology follow how there can be one grid. But I would love for one day and Aisa and Fiki, you know, get together and have a conference and explain for the lay people around the world as to how this one grid is achievable. I think visualization will move a lot of people and minds. Uh, let me come to the next question. It is from uh, James Matthew, he's the India correspondent for Arabian Business. It's uh, it's published by the British group uh, ITP Media. A uh, couple of questions. Um, whether is there any investment plan in the Middle East in the sector, solar or any renewable energy? And if yes, what are the details and some timelines? Where is the Middle East in this picture of ISA? Well, uh, we have the leading members uh, from uh, Middle East now, of course, so we have uh, Saudi Arabia, we have United Arab Emirates, and uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, Egypt. And uh, each of these countries, uh, they are doing wonderfully uh, well in uh, this, uh, in, in this regard. In fact, uh, in UAE, they have a beautiful uh, model, a solar park of some uh, 300 megawatt in one place and desert. and. They have got a, such a beautiful revenue model, you know, involving a Chinese company, an Indian implementing company, and uh, uh, a Japanese company giving money and all that. So uh, all these areas, in fact, Saudi Arabia has some of the mega projects that have come up. Maybe uh, 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 some of the agencies who are involved, uh, maybe SoftBank is involved in that, uh, the European Investment Bank is involved in that. So there is a major trend. 
The question comes, of course, uh, you know, I, I was discussing with a friend of mine with Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, their point was that if you can get it solar cheaper, and why don't you use solar and export oil? Uh, so essentially, there is an element of uh, competition, uh, you know, which gets cheaper, and what uh, they, uh, you know, how they utilize sun uh, to save more on uh, oil. But uh, they have the sunshine, they have the land, uh, and they have uh, money, and uh, there are companies who are willing to come and invest there. Banks are, uh, it's, a, it's a very, very resource rich area in terms of uh, solar. Um, you know, I think the next question is to you, Mr. Modi. So maybe you can answer this one and the next one together. Is um, the same from James Matthew? He's, he wants to know is uh, SB Energy, ISA, or any other? Entity planning a strategic tie-up with any of the GCC or Middle East-based companies or funds for setting up projects there, solar projects there. And are you getting you know, any funds from the region also? You know, Munish, I was. Uh, thank you for this question. And you know, it comes as no surprise given the profile of SoftBank. But I think I would keep it an ISA event and not get down to a SoftBank event. So I'm not going to answer corporate questions on SoftBank. But let me tell you something very interesting on the Middle East. Yeah. You know, Middle East has a problem of plenty. They are the ones who are plentiful of oil. They are the ones who are plentiful of sun. They are the ones who are plentiful of wasteland. They have to make choices. Now, let's recall companies, whether a Nokia or a Kodak or even an IBM or like any company in the world. If they do not see writing on the wall, they will get fossilized. If they do not keep ahead of the curve, they will get left behind. Middle East clearly has to make a choice. They made all the wealth and all the money by exporting oil. They are similarly placed in being able to export energy. They were different. You know, you created Panamax vehicles, vessels to create large amounts of oil. And having dredging done across Suez and Panama made life easy. For solar, you'll have to have grid. You'll have connectivity. That's where the investment will come to. SoftBank, for example, was talking of doing a 200 gigawatt solar plant in Saudi Arabia. 200 gigawatt, which was way ahead of anybody talk of a one world, one grid, which is exactly where it was going to. So to my mind, Middle East will have to have. In fact, the lowest price is eBay was a bit where we did not get it right, unfortunately. But I know in eBay, for example, the prices were down to sub one cent. So that's that's my that's my answer. So I think Middle East has to make choices, has to make conscious choices, has to cannibalize itself, has to read the writing on the wall, or they run the risk of being left here. One last question, and I know that uh, the, the, the Director General has to leave, and we had taken your time only until 1.40, but where where is the biggest traction coming from? Developing countries, led by India in the International Solar Alliance, or developed countries, or both? It's coming from the traction for solar is coming from both. If you today, if you look at the $150 billion that gets, comes as investment in the global market, it mostly goes to big countries like you know uh, Japan, China, USA, uh, maybe India, France, and uh, you know these type of countries. So the countries who need more traction are the countries who actually don't have uh, that much of capital today. But some of these are countries doing wonderfully well. For example, the other day, you know, the honourable minister from Togo was telling me they have come up with a energy policy where uh, they would decide that a portion of the country will be identified as a non-grid zone and they will go for mini grids uh, you know for uh, uh, electricity supply and all that so and uh, they have a better way of transiting from you know use of biomass uh, right up to solar so it is like you know people jumping into mobile phones so your yeah, traction is coming from those countries because they find this is a bigger opportunity to actually leapfrog from you know uh, not follow that traditional route uh, that most countries followed and uh, traction are coming from the richer countries because their carbon generation is more and they realize, you know, to keep the global mean temperature below 2 degrees Celsius, you do need a lot of, uh, you know, solar electricity or solarization, uh, not only using the, you know, sun's light, but also using sun's heat to treat the global, uh, you know, climate issues. So that way I look, uh, you know, I would say that uh, uh, and if you look at the ISAS membership, you know, we have UK as a member, we have France, we have Netherlands, we have Japan, we have Australia. These are all, uh, you know, developed countries. But at the same time, we have also a large chunk of countries from Latin America and Africa and Asia who are equally interested in the solar story. All right. Mr. Modi, anything to add? Otherwise, yeah, I can just up. say, you know, I want to say two expressions. One in Hindi, there is a saying, Tali ek haas se ni basti, dono haas se basti hai. 
basically saying you cannot clap with one hand, you need both the hands to clap at one level. I want to repeat the African proverb, if you want to go fast, you can risk going alone. If you want to go far, you have to work together. And so Quinn Tripathi said, beautifully, none of us can achieve anything on our own. Developed countries have the ability today. And if you look at it, most large investments are coming, let's say, from Canada, which is not such a large country, but a large number of investments in solar are coming from Canada, from Canadian pension funds. They can provide capital at a lower cost of capital. I wish one can have the same story for Japan can contribute much more in terms of lower cost of capital. Large investments, large scale investments, because these require tectonic shifts. Again, require economies of scale, lumpiness of capital, which can be contributed by developed countries. Consumption centers, clearly, because the developed countries already have an installed power base. They can only be replacing their existing power plants because the requirement for new power plants is much less. For them, it's a replacement value. For the developing and poor countries, they need to install much more power. So the consumption of power, consumption of solar panels, new installations will happen much more in developing, underdeveloped, poorer countries of the world. So one side can produce, one side can consume, one side can finance, one side can pay back. I think there's a great synergy to be had. And, that's, and I can again elaborate, but I think that would be such a good time. Great. No, thank you. That's a, that's a great answer. In the interest of time, we're going to wrap up. I know uh, Mr. Tripathi has to leave. Sanjeev is also going to jump off. He has a deadline. Venkat, could you please? Uh, give the vote of thanks and if you have any, uh, Venkat usually has very good question and, and comments he reserves for the last. Your your audio please Venkat, Venkat you need to turn on your audio. Uh, thank you. I have a question, you know this one sun, one world, one grid. It's, it's a beautiful concept and this World Solar Bank wants to raise one trillion dollars by 2030. Who exactly are you expecting to invest in this? If solar energy is going to be available at such a cheap rate, will the private sector be interested in investing this, uh, that kind of money? How much have you been able to raise so far? And what about a world solar grid? You know, like we are supplying electricity to countries like Bangladesh, Bhutan, we are hoping to do it to Sri Lanka and so on. Uh, how do you visualize distributing solar energy to different countries which uh, need solar power? And are we going to see in our lifetime driving a car with solar panels on top of the roof? I just switch on and I drive. Can I put on an AC? With the help of solar energy so that i can say goodbye to coal oil natural gas hydro power and nuclear energy mr sure. tripathi and then mr modi please uh, i will uh, thank start you. with your last question first you know uh, whether you can drive a solar car uh, uh, whether you drive actually a solar car uh, entire energy manufactured from its body or you drive uh, you know a solar car with the batteries are entirely charged by the sun. Uh, you know, the way storage is moving, you know, the fossil fuel bunks, the petrol bunks, or the gas bunks that we call, at some point, they all will be full of uh, battery, you know, batteries which are charged locally by maybe in the villages and all that. People have a trading in uh, batteries. They come, they take the old batteries, existed ones like refills, uh, you know, uh, gas cylinders. And they come and uh, the whole economy around that moves with uh, uh, batteries. But there is a university called Monash University. Uh, you know, they do non-silicon panels with uh, 3D printing, uh, something, you know, in technology that we didn't touch. And uh, these are as long as, uh, you know, silk saris uh, and uh, plug and play type. You can get, uh, you know, electricity from there. So they, some of them have devised cars, uh, which are actually, you know, uh, do generate a lot of solar energy. It's very highly efficient, uh, you know, uh, panels. And, uh, but coming back to that more in interesting question that you said, you know, what is going to be the shape of the, you know, one sun, one world, one grid, it is definitely not going to be just a ring around the globe. Uh, it has to connect the points of generation, the very high points of generation, what, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and the high points of consumption. And then it has to also connect the points of, very high consumption and the potential growth. So it has to be a, uh, you know, it will be something like international deadline. 
it's not uh, going to be a, a, a this thing and it will be driven by technology in terms of you know smart storage in terms of smart uh, you know grids uh, uh, so this will capture actually the best of uh, technologies and in terms of uh, investment from the you know world solar bank uh, world solar bank will have more focus into energy access issues because uh, if you look at you know all un organizations we all kept on promising by 2030 the world is going to have full energy access and just now they have found out that do whatever you are doing now business as usual at the end of 2030 you will still have 700 million uh, people without energy access and that is why you know we just tendered uh, 49 million home lighting systems you know it has 100 watts 200 watts 300 watts uh, you have uh, five led bulbs and that makes it makes it 250 million led bulbs so uh, so if you look at that, uh, the funding uh, of the World Solar Bank will not be mainly uh, for the uh, one sun, one world, one grid, because still we don't have a report, you know, a feasibility report, which says how it is going to move. Uh, but uh, your idea that we once engage on this and get some experts, uh, I, 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 it's a very good proposal. And I think at some point during the next four or five weeks, if we can organize it, we should do that. Modi ji, uh, you know, look at it very simple. Who would have imagined 50 years ago that we could be talking? We don't even know which part of the world you are sitting in. I can be talking face to face with you. Okay, how did it happen? It happened through under under sea telecom cables. If you can have under sea telecom cables, if you can have offshore wind farms, what prevents you from having under sea power cables? Very true. Who would have thought even 30 years ago that India would be a one grid? We were talking of state grids, we were talking of regional grids. Possibly India today is amongst the better countries in the world in terms of a national grid. If a country as diverse, as disparate as India can have one grid, if you can have telecom cables under the sea, if you can have wireless connectivities, last mile connectivities, I do not see why one, 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 one world, one grid would not happen. And believe me, it will happen faster than any one of us can ever visualize. That's my one simple answer to this. I'm an incredible optimist of technology, incredible optimist that man will find what is best for him. Thank and you. And it is best for everyone around the world. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> thanks very much, gentlemen. It was a pleasure listening to you all. It was very enlightening. And may, uh, on behalf of the Foreign Correspondents Club, I want to thank Fiki and ISA for collaborating with us uh, to do this uh, cut and raiser of an international press conference. And we'll be delighted to put the FCC facilities at your disposal because the whole world is your audience, uh, Mr. Tibati, Mr. Modi. Anytime you want to reach out to the global media, just think of us, okay? <laughs> And it was very educative. And I want to thank you all on behalf of the Foreign Correspondents Club of South Asia. Thank you, Monish. Thank you, Sanjeev. Thank you, Mr. Modi. Thank you, Mr. Tripathi. Have a great day. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you, to, to thank you, you Michael. And... Thank you, Monish. Thank you, Sanjeev. Thank, thank you, Mr. Swati. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you.